welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with special guest, Beth Benati Kennedy. And she's here today to share with us her new book, Career Recharge, Five Strategies to Boost Resilience and Beat Burnout. Now, Beth is an internationally recognized leadership coach and trainer who provides an achievable, authentic, and accessible path to increase workplace resilience. Her resilience model and five key strategy enhances career resilience and ability to recharge. These strategies, well-being, self-awareness, brand connection, and innovation are unique and easy to implement, even for people who already have a full life. So let's welcome to the show, Beth Benati Kennedy. Thank you very much. Great to be here. What an honor it is to have you here and to talk about your new book. And I have to ask you, like, what inspired you to write this book? So it's interesting. It's like a bunch of different layers, I would say. The first thing is that um, I've had a coaching practice for 25 years. And what I found was people were coming to me. It's mostly I focus on leadership coaching And people kept on coming saying, you know, I want to be more confident. I want to be more strategic and all these kind of buzzwords. And I realized that they had to focus on their managing their stress first and being resilient first before becoming a great leader. So that was kind of how it came to me, the practical aspect. And then I guess why it's so important to me is in my own life, my first career was as a school counselor in the Boston Public Schools, and I was very proactive with my well-being. I was a big exerciser, and I felt like, you know what, this is the career I'm going to be in forever. And there was so much burnout around me that even though I was focusing on my well-being, after nine years, I just couldn't continue. And I had to make a career change. And I feel like resiliency is a competency we all need to be focusing on. And it can enhance us, whether personally, professionally. And and that's how the book got developed. It really goes back to my personal experience. And then I developed a resiliency model in honor of my dad, um, who was super resilient, had his own business. And that model is what I use with all my coaching clients. And I've seen the impact that that can have on their career and their personal lives. So the book actually takes people through my model, and then talks about different challenges, but also the success stories of people working through some of the the challenge of careers. Oh my goodness, there's so many challenges (laughs) with careers. And when you talk about resiliency, I mean, a lot of times people, it can be kind of a buzzword. And I'd love for you to hear a little bit about what that really means. I am so glad you asked me this question because um, I feel so passionate that It's a lot different than if you look up the dictionary definition, which if you look in almost every uh, dictionary, it's something about bouncing back. And I have a really hard time with that because I feel like it means to me, if we're thinking about just bouncing back, it's like, okay, I can get, today I can go to work again and I can deal with this and then I can go back and, but it's more than that. It's, It's bouncing back, but it's moving forward through challenges and by taking time to recharge. So I believe, yeah, we want children to be resilient. We want all of us to be resilient, but it's not just dealing with it and having, piling that stress up. It's really figuring out a way to to press the pause button and take the time to recharge so we can move forward to have the career in life that we want. So I have kind of my own little definition. (laughs) I like that because a lot of times people think, well, I'm just going to bounce back. But when you are fried, bouncing back just means you bounce back fried. Right, exactly. And I also feel like it's kind of in a way setting us up to, to feel like you can, you know, be resilient. You can handle anything. And you know what? We're all realizing working 80 hours a week, people are getting ulcers, nervous breakdown. You know, I've seen it all, believe it or not, unfortunately. and So the goal of resiliency is not to be able to work harder and drive more. It's to be able to really have that career satisfaction you want, but also the life you want because you're taking care of yourself and and spending time to recharge. 
That's so important. Well, I'd love for you to share with us, what are some of the signs of burnout? Because a lot of times people are are like, oh, that's not me. I'm just a workaholic or I I have to do all these things. I'm not in burnout. Right. So this is another kind of word that that I have to clarify a little bit because this comes up a lot when I speak at places. People will say, Beth, but, you know, I feel like everyone's using that word now, burnout. And it's really, you know, what's the difference between burnout and being tired? And I think it's kind of a shame that, we, again, we're, we start to get caught up on all these buzzwords. I think what's most important to be aware of is burnout symptoms. So what does that mean? You're noticing that more than just one day a week, maybe two, three days a week, God, you're, you just, you, you're not excited about your job. You're feeling exhausted. You're feeling frustrated. You're not, we're, you know, we're, we're never going to be a hundred percent all the time, but you're noticing maybe you're 50, 60%. And you, and one of the things I share in the book was, which really, it's hard for me to actually share this and admit this because I was so passionate about being in the inner city schools and making a difference was one of the things that drove me crazy about these teachers is they would watch the clock. And soon as that, soon as it would hit that exit time, they would all go running out to their cars. And I was like, Oh no, I'll never be that way. I'll work an extra hour. And when I was getting those burnout symptoms, Oh my gosh, I became a clock watcher. So it's like you start to lose that energy in your zest. But the other piece that's really important is burnout. Really? You know, there are, five stages of burnout that I go through deeply in my book. But the part that I think we all have to realize, it's kind of like stress management is we have to really pay attention to ourselves and notice how are we feeling? You know, sometimes burnout is just you're, you're not even attentive to your children or to your partner. Um, You start to lose interest in other areas. So does it sometimes look like depression? Definitely. But it's, it's not, you know, some people say, oh, people shouldn't be using that word unless you're incapacitated. You know, you can't get up in the morning. And I disagree. I feel like if we're talking about burnout, that's good because it's the goal is to, to be aware of the signs before it does make you have to go to your doctor and be on a medical leave. So I think it's important. I think it's, it's important to talk about some of these hard things. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's only bringing it to light, then we're able to have these really candid discussions about it. Right. Oh, you know, gosh, you know what, I think I'm here as far as the level of burnout's concerned, I need to take better care of myself. Right. And some somebody actually recently shared with me this story, which I thought was interesting, too. They said, you know, I'm very involved also in my children's PTO. And I feel like, you know, it's not just a career, you can get burned out from volunteer activities. And I said, absolutely. So it's, it's, you know, it's something at some point we start just doing too much and we, we get saturated. It's dipping too much into our bucket and we're exhausted. Is that the number one reason people come to see you? Cause I know you have clients all over the world. Yeah, it's interesting. I would say the number one reason why people come to see me is they want to be, they want to be the best in their career. They want to be the best leader they can. So I work with a lot of um, individuals that, you know, have just risen up the ranks. They may be a, a vice president or they may be a senior director. And they they really want someone to kind of have some opportunity to share strategies with, but also to enhance their leadership skills. And interestingly enough, I can even tell over the phone many times, I can tell by their affect that something isn't going right. And they will say they're not stressed, they're not burned out. But then I do Typically, I do five to six interviews of people that work with them closely, and they'll say, "Oh my gosh, Beth, this—they are—they need a break. They're so burnt out." And so, so a lot of times, we—it can be one of those like depression. It can be an invisible thing we don't even realize we're in burnout, or again, having some of those burnout symptoms. So, I want to clarify that because again, people get so caught up on these dictionary definitions, and I really feel like it's just important to be aware of when we're not at our best in our career or our personal life. In your book, you talk about some of the stressors that people experience and love for you to share a couple of those with us. Sure. So I think one of them is probably right now we're all experiencing it. Those of us, those of you that are even listening to this call, it's being connected 24 seven. So it's really challenging. I was with a client yesterday and he came in and 
he, I could tell he was like all agitated and he showed me his iPhone and he said, how can I manage this in this company? And he had all the pop-up emails popping up. And I said, okay, <laughs> one step at a time, first of all. So, you know, technology can just take over our lives. So really figuring out way to have those, you know, to have those boundaries and to still to be attentive to our colleagues and our customers. So I think the 24 seven, that's, that's one that's just happening all the time. Um, the second thing is I'm seeing more and more, especially in, you know, the Boston area, the New York area, lots more reorgs going on. So change, there's so much change going on, which is stressful. People have, you know, I think scary, you know, debt from whether they have kids in college, whether they have houses and they want, people want to know that, you know, can I, is there security? And the reality is this is the world we live in. There's a lot of there's a lot of stressors, and that is where resilience comes in, because if we focus on what we have control over, then those stressors reduce, and they don't put us over the edge as much. So I'd say it's the workload, it's the 24-7, and also I think we're, we're seeing a lot with just uh, mental health these days, lots of anxiety, people taking care of aging parents, so um, it's a lot of mental health affecting uh, many people, and again, people not acknowledging it and taking the time for themselves. So I would say those are the top three. Um, it's 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 amazing that um, even even though we're aware of our stressors, today's world, I feel like it's just getting quicker and quicker and quicker, and it's hard to keep up. Mm-hmm. Without a doubt, I mean, you could just watch the news and get stressed, you know? Right, right. And I actually, I was actually reading an article where. They were saying for anxiety, um, one of the first things they recommend is reducing the, that media piece because it's the negativity is just, you know, gets those brain chemicals um, going. And, you know, you get too much of that cortisol, that stress hormone, and it's, they call it the depleted brain. You're exhausted by the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think everyone can kind of relate to that in one way or another. We get to that point where we're just like, just on overload because our lives kind of in many ways have demanded it where we have overbooked schedules and working overtime and kids and, you know, debt and all these things, but people don't have to live that way. Right, right. And it's tricky. I think, I think the social media is challenging too, because, you know, being self-employed and with the book, it's, you know, social media is so important but I've had to really say, okay, for me, I'm just going to focus on LinkedIn, my business Facebook page, and Twitter. And those are, you know, because if you try to do everything again, as an entrepreneur, you can, you can start to feel some of those burnout symptoms. It's in mm-hmm. a state of overwhelm. Yeah, without a doubt. Well, why don't you share with us the model that you um, developed um, from, from just your father, which I find very fascinating. What a great legacy to live. Yeah, he was one of these people where, you know, again, and the book kind of um, shares this, but unfortunately he died too soon because he was a workaholic. So one of the things that was interesting when, when it came to me after you asked what kind of clients do I get, mm-hmm. I get clients that honestly, they work too much, and but they really, really, really enjoy what they do. So it's tricky. It's really tricky. And that was my dad. He owned his own moving company. It was called Steinway Moving and Storage. It was in Astoria. And when I was a little girl and used to go on jobs with him, people would just rave about him. And I realized one of the areas of my model that he was really amazing at was connection. Um, That's the fourth area, which I will get to. But the first area he wasn't that good at, and that was well-being. And that's you know, taking time every day, just a little bit of time to focus on your physical, emotional, and spiritual health. And in the, in the book, I give some quick, easy, I call them resiliency boosters, strategies that you can work on um, from recommending meditation apps to recommending just getting out in nature. Share, I share a lot of research on the science um, of all these five areas and how it helps your resilience and how it helps um, you be more successful in your career. So that's the first one is well-being. The second one is self-awareness. And what I mean by self-awareness is really taking a mirror and looking at ourselves and thinking about, are we clear on what our purpose is? So what's kind of the difference we want to make in our world or in, the li- in our life? 
And I share that purpose is messy because it's, I think people get stressed out thinking they have to have this big passion and make a difference in the world. Sometimes your purpose is really small. Um, and as long as you know it, it helps you move forward. So part of self-awareness is your purpose. The other one, the other area is called mindset. And I have my clients think about, you know, do they have a growth mindset or a fixed mindset and how that affects us moving forward with our recharge, with our resiliency. And then finally type, personality type. And um, many of your listeners may be familiar with the Myers-Briggs or the DISC, but over, I guess, 30 years ago, I was uh, trained in the Myers-Briggs. And I just feel that it's so important to know our personality because it helps us understand our own stressors, but also how we react with others. And um, there's lots of online free free links where people can take their, their personality just to get a sense of that as well. So I offer that in the book. And the third area is your brand. And what I mean by that are what are the strengths and what are the gifts that you bring? And um, specifically, what are your attributes? And what's the impact you make in your career? So we often forget that to be resilient we have to think about what's the difference we're making for our department or for our organization and what's our reputation. So that's kind of a unique piece of my model is the branding. I am a certified personal brand analyst, so help my clients really figure out like a thumbprint, how are they different? And then the fourth area, as I mentioned, um, is really an area that my dad was fabulous at connection. And I would say that is an area that my clients are so surprised what a difference it makes when they focus on connection. And it's, you know, it's not like, and what I mean by that is not going to a networking event and collecting hundreds of business cards. It's really cultivating relationships. So I'd rather someone go to an event and have two quality conversations and stay in touch with those people and really build on that and, and actually have a connection plan. So um, what, what the research is also showing is that when we have great relationships, again, we get a lot of those awesome serotonin, those brain chemicals going, um, oxytocin. And again, it gives us that recharge. It gives us that energy. So the science is supporting um, all these areas as well. And the final area of my model is innovation. And what I mean by innovation is I always tell people to think about Disney. Well, Disney, it's about challenging yourself and personal development, professional development, but realizing it's also about taking risks and having some, some things that aren't going to work out because we know that our resilience develops by taking risks and it's not always going to be positive, but if we don't, if we don't take those challenges, we're going to sit, stay in that same little place. So those are the five areas. It's well-being, self-awareness, brand, connection, and innovation. I'm so glad you shared that with us. And I love the connection part. I think a oh, lot good. of times, yeah, because so many people, we feel so disconnected in the society that we have now. People feel lonely now more than ever. And being able to make meaningful connections with other people, I mean, how important is that? Yeah, it's, it is it is really um, interesting, too, that now there's been so many scientific studies to also show how important connection is. It's amazing. It's amazing. So what if, let's say we go to an event and we're, you know, or we just look at the group of friends that we have, but we also notice eh, maybe some of these people are a little negative or a little toxic. How do we decide what type of connections we should make? Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the things, one of the actually activities, I have a full day class that goes with the book. And one of the activities that I have my clients and also participants do is called Who's on My Boat? And what I have them do is I just, and, and those of you listening, you could do this after the call is over because I always like to make sure all these things are adding influence and impact. Um, you just draw a nice little stick figure boat and then you put on that, that boat. I want you actually write the initials of who are the people right now that are supporting you in your career and your life. And you know, you, you spend five minutes and you just put down those little initials or draw little stick figures. And what you want to look at is the second step you want to look at is, are these people, are you making the time for these people in your life? 
So these are the people that are nourishing you. These are the people that are supporting you. Or are you getting together with, and I call them, and I'm pretty uh, blunt about it in my book, um, toxic individuals, the individuals that are the dippers, that after you're with them, you know what? They didn't even ask you about you. (laughs) They're just taking from you. And again, it's not that we have to eliminate these people completely from our life, but what we want to look at is who are the people that are nourishing us and keeping us going over the waves. And these, and again, they, it might be five people that are keeping you sailing forward. But I think we, we have to remember how important it is. We have to be proactive and make sure we're spending time to get together with them. Now, it's amazing now with technology, with Zoom, with Skype, um, you can do video, you know, video conferencing so you can see people. But how often are we now texting people instead of saying, hey, do you want to get together for a cup of coffee? And I really believe we're missing out on trust from when we, by meeting people face to face, such a better chance to enhance trust. But I also believe, and I think the reason why we're seeing um, things like podcasts becoming so important is, again, people need to hear from others. So even if you call people up on the telephone and set up a connection schedule with some of these key people that nourish you, that's going to keep them really connected to you. So, and I see this happen a lot. People will say, oh my God, I'm job searching people, my friends aren't returning my calls. And then I say to them, when was the last time you spoke with them? Oh, two years ago, three years ago. So we need to nourish our relationships, not just when we're searching for a job, but but it's part of being resilient, keeping these people on our boat. So I think it helps to think of it that way because it's it is challenging. Time is challenging, but it's so worth it. Yeah. And and the thing is, I I so agree with you. If we're not having these personal connections with people, it is so disconnected, like text messages, anyone can do that. So there's no real effort that's involved in that. Right. And I know that, you know, and again, I know text messages, you know, I, I know all of these pieces are really important for success in certain projects, but I think deep down, we need to, we need to figure out a way to, to cut out, carve out some time every week to have more of that face-to-face interaction. Yeah, without a doubt. Well, and what are some ways that people can recharge themselves as they're, you know, they kind of like, gosh, okay, I've been in burnout. What are some suggestions you have for recharging? Yeah, so one of the things I want to share is um, I have a little strategy that I call Friday Five. And what I recommend, and again, I'd recommend everyone on the call do it, is you um, pick a time on Friday. So whether it's, if you're like me, I'm a, I love my coffee in the morning, or maybe it's at the end of the day, but what's the time where you can give five minutes to you? And I feel like we can all find five minutes and you put in your phone again, back to technology, but it can really help us. You just put in recharge for that five minutes. And, and I, and I have my clients and the participants in my training set the timer for five minutes. And then what I have them do is ask themselves three question. So you have five minutes. The first question is, what were my resiliency wins this week? So what did I do in the areas of well-being, self-awareness, brand, connection, or innovation? Some of my clients actually like to write it down. Some of us, you know, some people just like to keep it in their head, but it's like, you know what? Wow. I went to my yoga class or I exercised two times or I got together with a friend for lunch. So it's, you know, it's just, it's just celebrating what did I do? Because I think we, we see the research about celebrating the good things we're doing and not just kind of powering through everything. So that's the first question. The second one is, what is my resiliency goal for this week? So what is something that I can do? Because a lot of times we know what we need to do, but we just don't plan it in our calendar. So let's say for well-being, I know I want to get to the gym two days a week. So, okay, I'm going to write that down. I'm going to schedule that. Maybe for brand, I want to work on my LinkedIn profile. Okay, I'm going to schedule that in. Maybe for innovation, I want to listen to Moments with Marianne on the three shows that I missed. Schedule that in. So basically, the second question is setting, and I recommend not more than three goals. So what do I want to do for my resiliency for the week? But even one is great. Keep it small. And then the third question is, 
what is my plan? So if I am going to work on my LinkedIn, when am I going to do it? Maybe I'll do it Saturday afternoon. So one of the things that I find, and I think we see this a lot with New Year's resolutions, is sometimes we just keep saying, I want to do this, or I want to do this, and we don't sit down and make a plan. So I'm a big um, believer in a lot of Stephen Covey's concepts, and he has this great model with four quadrants. And he says, the key to success is quadrant two, and that's planning. So this is something I have found in my own life. The Friday Five has been helpful. And the, the kind of exciting news is I've been getting feedback um, from readers as well as clients saying, you know that? Five minutes makes a big difference. So I wanted to share that strategy because I feel like it's actionable and it's easy. And we all need what we, we all kind of know what we need to do, whether it's planning meals out on Sunday or maybe it's going for a walk at lunchtime or getting into nature or more time with our kids, but it's forgetting to plan it. So that's where the Friday five comes. Isn't that the truth? If it's not in my schedule, it doesn't happen. So I know, right. what it is. you know, because you, you do have to carve out time for yourself in the calendar and, you know, it could be like, you're, you're telling people you're at a meeting, but you're taking a walk in the park. It's your own personal meeting. Right. And, and the interesting thing, and my clients have shared this with me as well as I've learned this myself is, you know, sometimes it's only, we only need that three minutes of recharge and it's amazing what a difference it makes. Even for example, one of the things I wanted to share is, you know, we're hearing a lot about mindfulness and meditation. And one of the things I, my clients have shared with me that I've started introducing about three years ago um, is I have them look at different meditation apps because they all offer free weeks. And the interesting thing is by spending, you can spend five minutes a day, even three days a week with a meditation app, and you will notice in three weeks the benefits. I will say 80% of my clients notice the benefits. So I did want to share um, with the individuals on this call that um, the one that my clients have really found helpful as well as myself is calm.com. And I have other clients that are using Headspace. And I have other clients that really like uh, Dan Harris's app, which is 10% Happier. But what's fun about it is you can, you can pilot them all for a week. And it's amazing. To, I'm just amazed myself at the difference it can make, especially if you're someone who's a big multitasker, that changing that brain can really make you more focused, more productive, and less stressed. So I just wanted to make sure because to also share a specific recharge strategy that my clients have really enjoyed. Well, those are such great resources. I'm so glad you shared that, Beth. Where can people connect with you and be part of your community? Oh, great. So first of all, I would say my number one social media tool is LinkedIn. And I I publish a lot of articles through there. So it's a kind of a great way to kind of see what's going on. I also have a business Facebook page, which is Benati Training and Development, my business name. And I'm on Twitter at Coach B. Kenvey. And my website is www.bethkennedy.com. And on my website, I do offer a free monthly e-zine that you can sign up for. And it offers, um, I actually have one coming out uh, very soon. And it offers uh, an article that focuses on either resilience, branding, innovation, or connection. And then I offer a video. I offer a really quick spark strategy that people can start using right away. And then I end with just a fun motivational quote. But I do not do any marketing. I will let you know that. It's just uh, a service I provide to my clients. Once a month, they get a go to newsletter. And it, it also gives them some updates on what's been going on Um, with my book and kind of where I'll be speaking next. Oh, perfect. Well, you know, Beth, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. You're welcome. And thank you very much for the invitation. Well, thank you, Beth. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show to talk about career recharge. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In 
a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmaryann.com for more information.